Welcome to the GDPR Weekly Show, one of the top five GDPR podcasts worldwide. Here is what's coming up in this week's episode. So, coming up in episode 108 of the GDPR Weekly Show, we look at the implications now that Prov ID 19 test and trace data collection has become mandatory in the UK. We then look at a data breach from Virtual Mailroom, which has affected customers of Metro Bank, Aldermore Bank, and a number of local authorities, including Croydon, Eastbourne, Rygate, Ashford, North Tyneside, North East Derbyshire, and West Lindsay. We then have news from the ICO that the number of whistleblower reports has increased by 34% in 2019-20 compared to what it was in 2018-19. We then move to Northern Ireland, where the Northern Ireland Historical Abuse Inquiry has had a data breach. And we then come back to the north of the UK, where there is controversy after a data breach at Northumberland County Council. We then look at a data breach at gaming provider Razor, which has exposed details of over 100,000 customers. And we then come down to London, where some private hire drivers are seeking data from the Ola ride-hailing app. And staying with London taxis, we have news that ride-hailing app Wheelie is seeking guidance from the ICO on whether it can and should release customer data. We then have news of a data breach at Artec in the USA, which has released employee personal data. And we then return to the UK, where data breach specialist lawyers Hayes Connor have announced changes to their management team. We then have news from BlackBerry that they're opening new GDPR compliant data centres in Europe to complement their existing data centres in the UK. We then have a result of a survey of government data protection officers, DPOs, who say that they've seen an increase in the number of data subject access requests since the introduction of GDPR, but they feel that those increase in requests have not been matched by an increase in resources for them to do their work. We then look at data breaches, and instead of looking at someone breaking into your system or someone stealing documents from you, We're actually looking this time at the physical server security you need to have in place to prevent data breaches from directly from your server in your server room. We then look at some new guidance from the European Data Protection Board, the EDPB, on the data controller data processor relationship, and that's some really important new guidance, so please do listen to that article. And then we travel to the Far East, where we have news that Japan is now bringing its data protection law fully in line with GDPR. And finally, we look forward to the end of this year, or more specifically, the 1st of January 2021, and what your requirements are going to be to have both EU and UK GDPR representatives, depending on where you're based as a data controller, where your data processor is based, and of course, most importantly, where your customers are based. So again, a very important article for you to pay attention to. So as always, a good mix of articles for you this week. This episode is slightly longer than normal. It's around about 50 minutes rather than our normal 30 to 35. But we had so much to cram in that we felt we really couldn't miss anything out. And we always want to bring you the best GDPR news and updates that we can. We always welcome any feedback though. So if you have any feedback, please send an email to feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com. We do read every single piece of feedback we receive and we action them wherever we can. Unfortunately, due to the volume of feedback we receive, we're not able to always guarantee that we can reply to feedback emails individually. This is an important coronavirus update. Stay home. Protect our NHS. In addition to the well-publicised rule of six, the UK government has also this week introduced rules that say that premises and venues such as bars and restaurants and other social venues across the UK must now collect data on people visiting their establishments. Although there's been a voluntary call for this in the last few months since the establishments were allowed to reopen, it has now been made mandatory. So it's now law that establishments must collect this data and they must retain the data for 21 days. And obviously, as we previously discussed on the GDPR Weekly Show, this does bring GDPR implications because many of these establishments will not be used to the idea of keeping customer data in this way. And it is really important that however you choose to keep that data, if you are one of these venues, that you do keep it secure. A good example of this is that if you're collecting data by hand with pen and paper, maybe you've actually got a clipboard with paper 
at your entrance for people to fill this in themselves, that's really not a good way of doing it because you really need to have a separate sheet of paper for each group because otherwise one group can see another group's details and under GDPR they have no right to do that. So you do need to think about how you do it and there are a number of apps now which are becoming available for the detection of such data and indeed we hope to be speaking to the provider of one of those apps before next week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. So just to go into a little more detail of what's now happened, the government have said that businesses and other public settings where people meet socially, including hospitality, close contact and leisure venues, must report contact details of customers, visitors and staff of their premises to tackle the spread of coronavirus. The details must be stored for 21 days and shared with NHS Test and Trace if requested, and there are fixed penalties for organisations that do not comply. These rules will come into place from the 18th of September, so next Friday, Friday the 18th of September 2020. In addition to this, venues could be fined if they fail to ensure their premises remain COVID secure, such as failing to take specified steps to collect contact information or taking bookings for groups of more than six. Health and Social Care Secretary Matt Hancock said, NHS Test and Trace is a vital part of the government's response to fighting coronavirus, designed to help us return to a more normal way of life and reduce the need for local lockdowns in the future. The system cannot operate without the cooperation of business. We are now mandating venues to collect the necessary contact details and support NHS Test and Trace to stop the spread of the virus. Business Secretary Alok Sharma said, Each and every one of us needs to play our part to control the virus and avoid a second deadly peak. While the vast majority of businesses have done an incredible job by following the guidance to keep customers safe, we are now making it the law for certain establishments to collect the life-saving NHS Test and Trace data and to keep this on record for 21 days. We need to take these tough measures now to reduce the risk of local lockdowns in the future. If we don't all pull together to drive this virus down, businesses will need to close and people's jobs will be put at serious risk. The new rules mean that organisations in the scope will be legally required to request the contact details of every customer and visitor on their premises. The contact details which you have to collect include name, contact number, date of visit, arrival time and if possible departure time. It's emphasised that all data collected must comply with GDPR and will not be kept for longer than necessary. And it's also important to note that you cannot use this information for marketing. It's not the reason you're collecting the information. So if you're collecting the information to help with NHS Test and Trace, that's all you can use the information for. While we're on the subject of COVID-19, the other thing which is being mooted as possibly coming into force soon is the idea that particularly large employers will be asked to carry out weekly COVID-19 testing on their employees before they enter their premises. This, of course, is dependent on the UK establishing a testing regime where test results can be returned quickly. But the important thing here, from a GDPR perspective, is to remember that all the data which you collect in relation to COVID-19 testing is regarded as medical data and therefore highly sensitive special category personal data. So you do need to make sure you follow the special category rules for the data. And when you have someone who is found positive with COVID-19, Obviously, you need to tell the people who work around them, but you've got to try and do that wherever you can in a way of not identifying the person who had COVID-19. Now, I recognise that in a small office or a small group of people, that's probably impossible to do. People will work out, hey, who's missing? But you must use your best endeavours to not identify who the people with COVID-19 actually are. If you need any help with how you collect this data, what data you should be collecting, or maybe you just need a privacy policy that you need to be, you can show to your customers to show how you are storing their data and keeping their data and that you are committed to deleting that data after 21 days, then please just contact us at helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com and we'll be delighted to help you and we can send you out our template privacy policy for you to use and provide you with any other assistance that you might need. As I mentioned earlier, we hope to be speaking to one of the providers of apps for gathering COVID-19 data before next week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. So we look forward to bringing you that interview then. And now, the rest of this week's news. A data breach at a virtual mailroom this week led to the private details relating to more than 50,000 letters sent out by banks and local authorities being indexed by Google after the outsourcing company left its system exposed. 
Details about everything, from insolvency to final reminders of unpaid council tax and mortgage holidays, were left available for anyone to view, and it's been now been established that they've actually been available to view since June 2020. Thousands of names and addresses, and the types of letters they were sent, were left exposed, affecting people in the UK, the US and Canada. Virtual Mailroom, the firm responsible for the data breach, has a number of high-profile clients, including Metro Bank, 14 local councils, the publisher Pearson, and insolvency specialist Big Beast Trainor. It should be emphasised that the specific content of the letters sent to individuals were not visible. Now, this data breach raises doubts about due diligence being carried out by companies and local authorities who use outsourced mailing services to handle sensitive customer data. It also comes at a particularly painful time when many of the names and addresses contained in the breach belong to people who have been hit fi- hard financially by the COVID-19 pandemic. Such missteps could fall foul of GDPR, with data controllers and processors potentially facing penalties totaling millions of pounds. A spokesperson for the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, said that they were aware of the incident and were currently investigating. The details exposed by the breach are highly personal. Amongst the tranche of exposed personal data were the names and addresses of 6,500 customers of Aldermore Bank. The back-end system left exposed reveals which customers received pre delinquency and remediation letters. A spokesperson for Aldermore Bank says it's investigating the issue. Equally, more than 250 Metro Bank customers were identified with their company name and address. A Metro Bank spokesperson said the company has temporarily suspended sharing data with Virtual Mailroom as a precautionary measure while its internal investigations continue. On its website, Virtual Mailroom says it offers clients a simple but secure web interface that allows companies to upload documents, contact lists and other information and track the progress of mailouts and generate reports. A database of letters sent by local authorities reveals the names and addresses of 2,300 people living in Croydon. Councils in Eastbourne, Rygate, North Tyneside, Ashford, North East Derbyshire and West Lindsay were also caught up in the breach. One database showed the details of hundreds of people receiving letters from housing associations. While the bulk of the letters were addressed to people in the UK, it wasn't exclusively in the UK because Virtual Mailroom also sends out royalty statements for the publishing firm Pearson to the US and Canada, that all the more customers were addressed in Belgium, Poland, Germany, Italy, the United Arab Emirates, Sweden and Ireland, and a number of other international clients were also included in the breach. Mikhail Back, a director of Virtual Mailroom, said the company was the target of an attack that led to the data being posted online. We are clearly very concerned that we were the target of an attack to access information that we hold, he says, and he went on to say we have and are taking the necessary steps required to assist our clients and appropriate authorities in this instance. All the data left unprotected has since been secured, but not before it was left online for anyone to see since June. It's understood that the names, email addresses and telephone numbers of staff with access to virtual mailroom systems were also visible. The tools on the back end were also left unsecured, allowing for print and delivery jobs to potentially be modified or even deleted. This is obviously a very serious data breach and there will no doubt be more to come, so we will keep you up to date on this story in forthcoming episodes of the GDPR Week Show. The ICO has revealed that the number of whistleblower reports made to it in the last 12 months has risen substantially on the previous 12 months. Between April 2019 and March 2020, employees made 427 complaints to the ICO, up from 319 in 2019, according to law firm RPC. The ICO took further action in 68 out of the 427 whistleblower reports last year, with 23 considered for investigations. In the previous year, the ICO considered 55 for investigation. Increased awareness around data protection laws since GDPR protection may explain the increase in whistleblower reports. The ICO has also been encouraging employers to come forward with concerns about data mishandling. Richard Brevington, a partner at RPC, said whistleblowing is now a major risk for businesses that fail to deal with the data breach properly or who have failed to take reasonable steps to protect the data they hold on their customers. He went on to say, this makes it more important than ever for businesses who do fall victim to a data breach to respond quickly and to inform the ICO of the data breach if necessary within the right deadline and ensure customers are informed when they're exposed to a major risk. And that, of course, backs up everything that we always say here at the GDPR Weekly Show. It is crucially important that your whole team know what to do in the event of a data breach. And we're always happy to provide training on data breaches, so should you require any training, please just contact helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com and one of our specialists will be delighted to help you. What's up, Isabella? I'm fed up. I wish I had a new job. Have you tried Jubal? Jubal.org. We help people find jobs. 
Great! I will try it now. To Northern Ireland now, and news of a data breach from the Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry. The Northern Ireland Executive Office has confirmed it is in negotiations with some victims of historical abuse for financial damages after their personal details were leaked in a data breach. In May, it emerged that a newsletter had been sent without details of 251 recipients being anonymised. Following an investigation, it was found to have been a procedural error. The Executive Office said it had now received letters seeking compensation in respect to the data breach. It confirmed that officials were currently in negotiation with claimants. A spokesperson said, as these are matters which may in due course come before the courts, it would not be appropriate to comment further on the claims at this stage. Some of the individuals whose details were published in the data breach had been part of the historical institutional abuse inquiry and had chosen to remain anonymous. The newsletter, which was sent via email, was signed off by a staff member but issued on behalf of interim victims advocate Brendan McAllister. At the time, it was described as a massive breach of confidence for victims and survivors, with some calling for Mr McAllister to resign. Mr McAllister apologised, but he said he would remain in post until a full-time commissioner for HIA victims and survivors had been appointed. Earlier this year, First Minister Arlene Foster said she hoped the commissioner would be in place by late August. But the executive have told us that the final stage of the selection process was still taking place this week and that it hoped to make an announcement shortly. Claire McKeegan, a solicitor who represents some of the survivors, said she had been instructed by more than 80 survivors to take the action requesting damages. The current offer being made by the executive office will not be recommended to our clients, she said. It is likely we will proceed to obtain expert medical evidence on behalf of our clients in order to quantify the impact of this appalling situation. Ms. Tegan said that the data breach identified people who had suffered significant trauma that many had never talked about and that standards had fallen well below those expected. Another law firm, KRW Law, which represents three groups of abuse victims and survivors, confirmed it had also received offers of compensation for all 40 of its clients who had been affected by the breach. It said it could not divulge any details as it was subject to ongoing negotiation. The Northern Ireland Executive Office has said it was a deeply regrettable incident and it recognised the significant impact it had had on victims and survivors. We are aware that the data breach has been notified to the Information Commissioner's Office, who are carrying out their own investigation. If we receive any update on this, either from either the Northern Ireland Executive or the Information Commissioner's Office, we will, of course, bring it to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. There is controversy at Northumberland County Council. Northumberland County Council has apologised for a data breach understood to have been made by its now deposed council leader in a message to members of his own party. But the councillor in question, Councillor Peter Jackson, who stood down after a vote of no confidence, has denied the alleged data breach and hit back with claims of illegal activity at the council itself. Northumberland County Council has been embroiled in a scandal ever since its chief executive, Daljeet Lally, was put on a period of extended leave in August. Mrs Lally made a series of whistleblowing claims regarding the current council leadership in an email to councillors before her departure. It's understood that an email sent by Councillor Jackson to a number of fellow councillors last week that they had serious concerns about the Northumbria International Alliance project, a partnership between the council and Northumbria Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. But in an email seen by the Chronicle Live newspaper, Interim Acting Chief Executive Kelly Angus claimed the email constituted a breach of General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, as she said it included personal information and unvalidated financial information. She said the incident had been reported to the Information Commissioner's Office, the ICO, and that members who had received the information had been told to delete it. A council spokesperson issued an apology for the error, which it said should not have happened under any circumstances. If we receive any update from this, either from Northumberland County Council, the ICO, or indeed from Councillor Jackson himself, then we will of course bring it to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. A cloud misconfiguration at Gaming Gear Merchant Razor potentially exposed 100,000 customers to phishing and fraud. Razor, a purveyor of high-end gaming gear ranging from laptops to apparel, have had their private info exposed, according to a researcher. If you're a regular listener to the GDPR Weekly Show, you'll know that several times we've mentioned the name of Bob Dioshenko, who specialises in finding data breaches amongst organisations. In this case, Bob ran across a misconfigured Elasticsearch cloud cluster that exposed a segment of Razor's infrastructure to the public internet for anyone to see. 
It contained a raft of information of use to cyber criminals, including customers' full names, emails, phone numbers, customer internal IDs, order numbers, order details, and their billing and shipping addresses. Diashenko said that he estimated the number of customers affected to be around 100,000. In a LinkedIn post on Thursday, he said the exact number of affected customers is yet to be assessed, as originally it was part of a large log chunk stored on a company's Elasticsearch cluster, misconfigured for public access since August 18, 2020, and indexed by public search engines. Bob said that he discovered the exposed database on August the 18th and on August the 19th notified the company of the issue. After getting a support ticket and case number via Razor's support channel, the remediation process was bogged down by being bounced around between non-technical support managers for more than three weeks, he said. Finally, the cloud instance was secured from public access. There's no way of knowing whether the database has been accessed by other more nefarious web surfers, but Diashenko pointed out the information could be used in social engineering and fraud attacks. Bob said the customer records to be used by criminals to launch targeted phishing attacks wherein the scammer poses as Razor or a related company. Customers should be on the lookout for phishing attempts sent to their phone or email address. Malicious emails or messages might encourage victims to click on links to fake login pages or download malware onto their device. We've not had any update on this from Razor themselves, but when we receive such update, we will of course bring it to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. I love this show, but I've got GDPR questions and don't know what to do. It's simple. Just follow the instructions coming up and the guys at GDPR Weekly Show will help within 24 hours. All you need to do is email helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com with the details of your GDPR issue and one of our specialists will get straight back to you. Bye, kids. Thanks, Mike. To London now, where two private hire drivers backed by their union, have launched legal action against OLA in the Netherlands, alleging violations in data protection law under General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. They accuse OLA, the India-based ride hiding giant, of denying their right of access to their personal data held on the platform and for failing to provide adequate transparency into how they are performance managed by its algorithm. The drivers are being supported by the App Drivers and Couriers Union, the ADCU, the International Alliance of App-Based Transport Workers, the IAATW, and Worker Info Exchange. Whilst it is claimed that OLA have provided the drivers with some access to the data after they made subject access requests, the drivers say there remain huge gaps in what has been provided. One example given by the drivers includes being denied access to date-stamped GPS data, which they say significantly reduces the ability of drivers to carry out meaningful performance analysis of their own. OLA have also blocked access to ratings data at the trip level, which eliminates the possibility to challenge unfair or discriminatory ratings. It's claimed this impacts the quality and quantity of work offered on the platform and can even result in dismissal. The complaint is also critical of OLA's data protection policy, suggesting a high degree of driver surveillance and performance management, despite offering very little in the way of driver's basic worker rights. The drivers say OLA has failed to provide adequate transparency into the logic of processing of personal data by algorithms which allocate work to drivers. The drivers will now ask the district court in Amsterdam to make an order that OLA immediately comply with data protection law and be fined €2,000 for each day that it remains outside of compliance with such a court order. The action has been taken in the Netherlands because OLA Netherlands BV, the corporate entity that controls the platform and driver data, is based in Amsterdam. The ADCU is working with the non-profit Worker Info Exchange to establish a data trust for drivers for the purpose of collective bargaining. The drivers will ask the court to order OLA to respect their right to import personal data directly from OLA to their union's fledgling data trust. The legal action is also supported by the International Alliance of App-Based Transport, IAATW workers, which represents OLA drivers in India through Majaracha Raja Rastrija Chamda Sang based in Mumbai. The drivers will be represented in the Netherlands by their their attorney, Anton Ecker. James Farrer, director of Worker Info Exchange, said OLA drivers endure intensive surveillance of work, yet are denied access to their own personal data on the platform, and to basic transparency as to how they are performance managed by algorithm. Workers in the so-called gig economy face a bleak and dystopian future, unless firms like OLA are forced to obey the law and respect the digital rights of their workforce. 
Yazin Aslam, president of ADCU, said Ola could choose to use its technology for good to ensure drivers are well paid, protected and treated with dignity at work. Instead, Ola was taking advantage of its position and platform power to exploit and impoverish its workforce. It's time for drivers to take back control and build selective power. The first step is to demand access to their own data at work. Anton Ecker of Ecker Advocate said, Ola, with Ola based in the Netherlands as operator of the Ola platform, the Dutch courts now have an important role to play in ensuring Ola's compliance with GDPR. This is a landmark case in the gig economy, with workers asserting their digital rights for the purpose of advancing their worker rights. We are very interested in the outcome from this case, and so we will keep a close eye on it for you and bring you any updates in future episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show. Another ride-hailing app was also in the news for data reasons this week. The ride-hailing app Wheelie has written to the UK Information Commission's office, the ICO, after claiming it has been pressured into potentially breaking GDPR by handing over data on its journeys to the Moscow Department of Transportation, MDOT. Wheelie, which has headquarters in London, last month had its Russian subsidiary suspended from operating by a Moscow court for 90 days after it refused to hand over the information that it argues could be used to breach the privacy of individual customers. The case is the latest row between a major city and a ride-hailing app about the balance to be struck between regulating transport and customer privacy. In the letter to the ICO sent last month, Wheelie Chief Executive Anton Shurkanov said, We are very concerned that sharing the data with the MDOT would likely result in a high risk to the privacy rights and freedoms of the individuals to whom it relates due to the sensitive and very detailed nature of the information sought. We think it unlikely that we, or any other business established in the EU and operating a right hailing service in Moscow, would have a legal basis for the purposes of GDPR to share the requested data with MDOT. Wheelie has asked the ICO to urgently consider the legal position and how other European ride hailing companies that operate in the Moscow market have complied with the request and take immediate action to ensure that any harm to individuals concerned is prevented. A spokeswoman for MDOT said, According to the Mayor's decree, the Department of Transport and Road Infrastructure Development of Moscow requested the location of a car and a route it travels as well as brief information about the driver, the absence of a criminal record, positive driving experience and other data to make sure the service is carried out safely. Passengers' personal data has never been requested, neither name nor payment method, nothing that should reveal personality. She added that other operators, including Get and Uber's Russian joint venture with Yandex, had provided the data and so had not had their operations suspended. Wheelie argues that the information supplied to MDOT could be used to work out details relating to individual customers. Get, Uber and Yandex declined invitations to discuss the data they had provided to MDOT. What's up, Mike? I'm fed up. I wish I had a new job. Have you tried Jubal? Jubal Jubal.org. We help people find jobs. Great. I'll try it now. Artec Information Systems, one of the largest IT staffing companies in the USA, has disclosed a data breach caused by a ransomware attack that affected some of its systems during early January 2020. Artec is a privately held firm with an estimated revenue of some $810 million and more than 10,500 employees and consultants across 40 US states, Canada, India and China. The company provides staffing and workfare solutions, program management and government services, and its customer list includes over 80 Fortune 500 clients and US federal government. The ransomware attack was discovered by Artec after finding ransomware on some systems following reports of unusual activity related to one of its employees' user accounts. In the data breach notification letter sent to affected individuals, the company said that same day Artec engaged the leading third-party forensic investigation firm to assess the security of its systems and to confirm the nature and scope of the incident. On January 15, 2020, the investigation determined that an unauthorised actor had access to certain Artec systems between January 5, 2020 and January 8, 2020. On January 11, the Reveal ransomware gang leaked 337 megabytes of what they claimed to be stolen details from Artec onto the internet. Revel's operator said at the time, this is a small part of what we have. If there are no movements, we will sell the remaining more important and interesting commercial and personal details to third parties, including financial details. It is understood that Artec had to shut down all the systems, but were able to restore critical services and servers from backup data. Revel was a ransomware-as-a-service operation that breaches corporate networks via exposed remote desktop services and compromised managed service providers, as well as by using exploits and spam emails. 
Once they gain access to a victim's network, the rebel operators will spread laterally, stealing sensitive data to be used as leverage to pressure to be used as leverage to pressure the once they gain access to a victim's network, the rebel operators will spread laterally, stealing sensitive data to be used as leverage to pressure the victims into paying the ransom under the threat of publicly leaking the data. After gaining administrative access to a domain controller and stealing data from servers and workstations, Revel displays ransomware payloads on all computers on the company's compromised network. While investigating the incident, Artec discovered personal, health and financial information of multiple individuals stored on the compromised systems. Around June 25, 2020, when the company had completed the attack investigation, it was able to determine the individuals who had the information impacted during the ransomware attack. In a statement, Artec said the investigation determined that at the time of the incident involved, the files may have contained information including names, social security number, medical information, health insurance information, financial information, payment card information, driver's license and state identification numbers, government-issued identification numbers, passport numbers, visa numbers, electronic and digital signatures, usernames and password information. The combination of exposed information is different for every affected individual, according to the company statement. After discovering the attack, Artec changed system credentials to secure its systems and started working with external security experts to improve the company's existing security processes and protocols. Artec urged affected individuals who received a data breach notice to monitor account statements for suspicious activity and to be vigilant against fraud and identity theft attempts. The company also provides them with free credit monitoring and identity protection services through Troll. Regular listeners to the GDPR Weekly Show will know that we have, on a number of occasions, had interviews with representatives from Hayes Connor solicitors. And we learned this week that Hayes Connor, the UK's leading data breach law firm, have a new management team. Hayes are now the UK's leading data breach specialist with a team of 15 lawyers and assistants and a wealth of collective experience. The team is paving the way in all things data breach, cyber security and online fraud related. In just over two years, they've settled over 300 claims for their clients, securing compensation from £1,000 to well over £100,000 against a wide range of organisations, including multinational corporations and banking giants. Fee income has doubled over the last 12 months, and the new management team will be working hard to deliver the same again next year. Dan Thompson, William Betts and John Else now have full control of the business, and the client service team is now headed up by senior associates Christine Sabino and Richard Forrest. This reorganisation comes at a key time for Hayes Connor, with the firm predicting a big increase in the number of people likely to bring data breach claims post-lockdown. With COVID-19 changing the way we live and work in the UK, millions of people are working from home, making it harder for employers to ensure their team are following data protection guidelines and IT security. Dan Thompson, director at Hayes Connor, said, We are excited to be reorganising our team and building upon the great work that has been done by Christine, Richard and the team over the past two years. Going forward, everyone will have a great say in the direction of the business, and that's something we're really proud of. As always, we should enter the normal disclaimer that we have no financial or other commercial relationship with Hayes Thomas Listers. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. BlackBerry has announced that it will open additional data centres in France and the Netherlands, as well as expanding its existing data centre in the UK, to help customers comply with GDPR and the upcoming public warning directives. The new directive on the European Electronic Communications Code, EECC, which was adopted in 2018, is to ensure that all EU member states establish a public warning system to protect citizens in cases such as natural disasters or terrorist attacks. The data centres will be used to store the personal data of citizens, ensuring that it's all compliant with GDPR. Using its emergency mass notification system, at hoc, BlackBerry aims to provide organisations with a secure way of communicating emergencies to their workforce. Staff will be able to be notified with the help of mobile apps, desktop applications, sirens and building systems such as fire panels. Adam Entertin, Senior VP of EMEA at BlackBerry, said it's vital for BlackBerry to adhere to new and existing EU data residency requirements as per GDPR. With BlackBerry at Hoc's new EU-based data centres, we are able to scale our infrastructure to better support our customers' needs over a secure and reliable network, he said. Adding that empowering BlackBerry's customers with the most secure communication platform for increased resiliency and communicating swiftly is critical in a crisis. In July, the company announced that it was partnering with Vodafone 
to offer the BlackBerry at hoc platform as a crisis communication solution for UK emergency services. The mobile app is already used by military, government and commercial organisations in order to provide their workforce with physical security, force protection and personal accountability. Greater Manchester Police and Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service were the first two clients to benefit from the partnership, with Greater Manchester Police Inspector Darren Spurgeon saying that the system was chosen to allow the police to share and receive real-time information across our business and police operations. BlackBerry at Hoc will help us rapidly respond to internal operational issues and ensure accurate information is shared across multiple police departments and personnel using both analogue and digital channels, he added. Data protection officers, otherwise known as DPOs, working in central government departments, agencies and associated public bodies across the UK, say they've seen a doubling in volume of data protection requests since the introduction of GDPR, but they also say that they're not adequately resourced when it comes to dealing with the new workload. A study conducted by eCase included the Department of Work and Pensions, DEFRA, HM Revenue and Customs, the Ministry of Defence and the Treasury. The survey of central government DPOs found that 70% had seen significant increases in their workload since GDPR became law, while 40% had received no extra team resources to manage this and 33% were still managing requests manually or with support from a basic spreadsheet. An 83% majority, however, had experienced an increase in support and recognition from their management team. John Baines, chair of the National Association of Data Protection and Freedom of Information Officers, NADPO, and a data protection advisor at law firm Michon de Rea added, I welcome this report as its findings should help inform not just decisions made in government and the public sector, but also across the wider spectrum of private organisations. Help! I love this show, but I've got GDPR questions and don't know what to do. It's simple. Just follow the instructions coming up and the guys at GDPR Weekly Show will help within 24 hours. All you need to do is email helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com with the details of your GDPR issue and one of our specialists will get straight back to you. Bye kids! Thanks Mike! When we talk about data breaches, most of us either think about an intruder electronically somehow gaining access to a computer system or malware being put onto a system or an employee inadvertently sending data to the wrong person or losing data externally. However, it is worth bearing in mind, of course, that also a data breach is if someone breaks into your premises and steals your server. And so it's worth thinking about what you can do physically to prevent a data breach. First thing, of course, is making sure that access to your server room is restricted. What you don't want is a bad actor who enters your server room, takes control of your networks by setting up remote access or downloading malware directly onto the server, or perhaps one employee invites in another who doesn't have authorization to be in the server room, and that employee inadvertently does something to your server. Concerning the server itself within the server room, you need to think about backup solutions and where you keep those, because they're a possible point that someone might choose to attack and steal your equipment. But someone could attempt to steal the server itself if you don't properly protect it in a stack and lock it. And the other reason, of course, for locking your server room is to make sure that no one installs a device in your server room without your permission. A rogue device could steal personally identifiable information and other sensitive information from your own servers. So what can you do about this? Well, in terms of access to the room, you can think about, obviously, combination locks or maybe even a biometric scanner so that, you know, you use fingerprints or retina recognition to let people into the room. It really depends on how much data you've got and how important it is. What is worth considering is the use of turnstiles or man trap door systems that only allow one person through at a time, which will prevent an unauthorised person from tagging along. You should also, of course, make sure that each server has its own password, so that should someone gain access to a server without your permission, that doesn't mean that they can then gain access to all of your servers. And depending on the sensitivity of the data in your server room, you might want to install CCTV into the room so that you can watch what's going on. But it's worth remembering as well that physical security doesn't just mean protecting your server from being stolen. It also means thinking about protection from power outages, from fire, from flood, all of these things which can affect your server and all of which would cause you to have a data breach. So just some food for thought there, hopefully, which shows that it's not just someone hacking into your system that causes a data breach. There are many other ways. We spoke about paper documents a few weeks ago. And this way of actual physical harm to the equipment 
is also something that you need to consider. As always, if you need any help with this, we'd be delighted to help you. Just reach out by sending an email to helpdesk at gplweeklyshow.com. On September the 7th this year, the European Data Protection Board, the EDPB, released draft guidelines on the concepts of controller and processor in GDPR. The guidelines aim to clarify the concepts of controller, joint controllers, processor, third party and recipient under GDPR by providing concrete examples with respect to each and specify the consequences attached to different roles of controller, joint controllers and processors. The guideline replaced the previous opinion of the Article 29 Working Party on these concepts. Hopefully, if you're involved at all in GDPR, you're familiar with the concepts of a data controller and a data processor and the relationship between the two, and that sometimes you may also, of course, have joint data controllers. And so what this new legislation seeks to do is to give examples of what they mean in different situations because there have been some areas of GDPR in the controller processor relationship which have been subject to personal interpretation and the aim of these new guidance is to take away some of that interpretation and actually lay down some standards. So in a brief takeaway of what's in the guidelines for controllers The concept of controllers should be interpreted in a sufficiently broad way so as to ensure full effect of EU data protection law, in other words, full effect of GDPR. Interestingly, the new information says that the controller may not necessarily have access to the personal data. So you might use a data processor to do everything with your data, but you still control what happens to that data as a data controller. And to build on that a little, it says that controllers must determine both the purpose and meanings of the processing of personal data, i.e. the why data is being processed and the how of how data is being processed. Accordingly, if an organisation only determines the purpose of the processing, this will not be sufficient to qualify the organisation as a data controller. To be considered a data controller, the organisation will also have to determine essential means of the data processing e.g. the type of personal data process, the duration of data processing, the categories of data recipients and the categories of data subjects. Conversely, decisions on non-essential means of data processing can be left to the data processor, i.e. the type of IT system or other technical means used for the data processing or the details of the security measures to be implemented based on the general security objective set by the data controller. So then if we look at processors, the new guidance is that data processors may have a certain discretion about how to serve the controller's interests, e.g. by choosing the appropriate technical and organisational means of data processing. However, processors can never determine the purpose of the data processing. A processor will infringe GDPR if it goes beyond the controller's instructions and starts determining its own purposes and means of processing. Nothing prevents processors from offering a preliminary defined service but the controller must make the final decision to actively approve the way the data processing is carried out and must be able to request changes. Processors cannot at a later stage change essential elements of the processing without the approval of the data controller. So then if we look at the situation where you have a joint data controller, the qualification as joint controllers implies the joint participation of two or more entities in the determination of the purposes and means of a data processing activity. Joint participation can take the form of a common decision by two or more entities on the purposes and means of data processing or simply result from converging decisions on those purposes and means. An important criteria to identify converging decisions in this context is whether the data processing would not be possible without both parties' participation. In practice, joint controllership may arise where the parties pursue purposes that are closely linked or complementary. The parties may jointly determine the means of data processing when they use a platform or standardised tool that has been set up in a certain way by one of the parties and made available to others. But the others must also be able to decide how that's set up. And that's an important point to retain being a data controller. So then turning now to the relationship between data controller and data processor, one important thing which is brought out in the new guidance is that controllers must only use processors that provide sufficient guarantees to implement appropriate technical and organisational measures. When assessing a processor's guarantees, controllers should take into account the processor's expert knowledge, reliability and resources. This assessment should be carried out at appropriate intervals and not only at the onboarding stage. In other words, you should set up regular reviews of when you review your data processors. 
The data processing agreement that the controller and processor must execute in accordance with Article 28 of GDPR must not simply restate the provision of GDPR. Rather, the data processing agreement should include more specific and concrete information as to how GDPR requirements will be met in practice. In particular, the contract should specify the data security measures adopted by the processor, impose an obligation on the processor to obtain the controller's approval before making any changes to the list of security measures, and a regular review of those measures to allow the controller to assess their appropriateness. Similarly, the data processing agreement should contain details as to how the processor will help the controller meet its obligations under Articles 32 to 36 of GDPR. That is, those obligations related to the security of the personal data, data breach notifications and data protection impact assessments. Further, when the controller provides a general authorization to the processor to engage sub-processors, such authorization should be supplemented with criteria to guide the processor's choice. Where you have joint controllers, then in terms of the relationship between the joint controllers, first thing is that joint controllers must determine and agree on their respective responsibilities for complying with GDPR. In terms of content, this arrangement should cover not only the party's obligations to provide notice and comply with data subject access requests, but also the other obligations of controllers under GDPR, such as the implementation of GDPR fundamental principles, the obligation of a proper legal basis for data processing, the implementation of data security, the obligation to notify personal data breaches to competent supervisory authority and the affected data subjects, the obligation to conduct data protection impact assessments where applicable, the use of data processors, the obligation to ensure compliance with the cross-border data transfer restrictions and of course after SREMS too, that becomes even more important, and the organisation of contact with data subjects and supervisory authorities. The allocation of responsibilities between joint controllers should take into account factors such as which party is in the best position to comply with those obligations. It's important that although it's a joint controller relationship, the GDPR obligations do not need to be equally distributed amongst the joint controllers. So you could have one day joint controller who's doing 90% of the work and the other controller is only doing 10%, that's fine, you're still joint controllers. The GDPR further requires that the essence of the arrangement between the joint controllers be made available to data subjects, i.e. you've got to declare with somewhere within your privacy policy that you're not the sole data controller, you have joint data controllers. We recognise that some of this article is a bit technical, and so if you'd like any further discussion on it or any help with implementing it within your organisation, then as always reach out to us at helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com and we'll be delighted to help you. What's up, Isabella? I'm fed up. I wish I had a new job. Have you tried Jubal? Jubal Jubal.org. We help people find jobs. Great. I will try it now. You may have seen in the news this week that the UK reached a trade agreement post-Brexit with Japan. What perhaps didn't receive so much publicity this week was that Japan has made changes to its 2005 Protection of Personal Information, APPI Act, bringing the bill closer in line with GDPR. The latest tweaks announced this month cover data breach reporting and the use of facial recognition data gathered from devices such as security cameras. Data breaches should now be reported using an official form rather than simply by mail or fax as before. When processing image data, the intended use should be stated immediately while the methods and privacy measures used while processing that such images should also be made clear. These additions follow hard on the heels of more significant changes which mean tight controls on the international transfer of data from 2022, helping to bring the law even further in line with GDPR. It's important to remember that Japan is the only country in Asia to have exchanged joint adequacy findings with the EU, finding the laws roughly equivalent. While in its current form, the APPI applies to any organisation obtaining personal information from data subjects located in Japan, this hasn't been enforceable on foreign businesses. Now, though, they will have to provide reports concerning the processing of Japanese residents' personal information and can be given penalties if they fall short. In addition to the move towards reporting via a specific web form, there's also a new requirement for all breaches to be reported to the victim and the Personal Information Protection Commission, the PPC. It's not yet clear whether all breaches will need to be reported, but major incidents or those that violate the rights of subjects almost certainly will. Thanks to the GDPR-like changes, Data subjects will now have the right to request access to their data and to ask for it to be corrected or deleted, where there's a possibility that their rights or legitimate interests have been breached. This also applies to short-term data. Previously, the Japanese law only applied to data that was held for six months or more. Where the 
law differs from GDPR, though, is that currently there's no need for a data subject to give explicit consent when data is transferred to a third party. This, though, is set to change and permission will become opt-in. Further, if data has already been transferred on an opt-out basis, it cannot now be transferred to a third party without permission. And the organisation receiving the data will have to conform to the same APPI standards. Organisations that violate the rules now face a potential fine of 100 million yen, which is 942,000 US dollars, while falsifying a report to the PPC will cost you half a million yen, or 4,708 dollars. Meanwhile, any individual found responsible for a breach could face a fine of up to 1 million yen, which is 9,420 US dollars, and a year in prison. The move brings Japan to the forefront of Asian data protection legislation, along with South Korea, which has had strong data protection laws for years. Across Asia, it's known that two other countries are moving towards bringing their laws in line with GDPR, those two countries being Vietnam and Thailand. With the outcome of the SREMS 2 case, which we've mentioned in previous episodes of the GDPR Weekly Show, and the looming end of the Brexit transition period, we thought we'd have a quick look at how that affects what you're going to need in terms of EU and UK representatives, depending on where your business is based. And bear in mind that all of this is taking effect from the 1st of January 2021. So if your data controller and data processor are based in the UK or the UK and the rest of the world, but not the EU, then if you sell to a monitor the UK only, then you don't need a EU or UK data representative. If you sell or monitor to the EU and not the UK, then you will need an EU representative. And if you sell or monitor to the UK and the rest of the EU, then you'll need an EU representative. If your data controller and data processor are both based in the EU, i.e. outside of the UK, and you sell to or monitor the UK only, you will need a UK representative. If you sell to or monitor the EU only outside of the UK, you won't need any representative at all. And if you sell to or monitor the UK and the rest of the EU, you will still now need a new UK representative. If your data controller and data processor are both based outside of the UK and the EU, then if you sell to or monitor the UK at the moment, you already need an EU representative, but post-Brexit you'll need a UK representative. If you sell to or monitor the EU only, you'll need an EU representative. But if you sell to or monitor the UK and the rest of the EU, but you yourself, your data controller and data processor, are based outside of the EU and the UK, you'll need an EU representative and a UK representative. Now, we're very pleased to be able to announce today that we already provide EU representative services and a number of our clients make use of that, but we're now also providing UK representative services. So if you are either a data controller and processor based in the EU, but outside of the UK, or you're outside of the EU and the UK, but you're dealing with customers in the UK and you'd like a UK GDPR representative, then obviously we would be delighted to represent you. We do so for a very low cost. And if you'd like to find out more, please just drop an email to brexit at gdprweeklyshow.com and our specialists will be delighted to get in touch with you. So that brings us to the end of this week's episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. I hope you found it useful. I hope you found it entertaining. Please do let me know. Let me have your feedback by sending an email to podcast.insurity.co.uk. You can find out more about us and Insurity at www.insurity.co.uk. And I look forward to speaking to you again, same time, same place, next week. Have a good week, everybody, and remember to keep your data safe. And cut. That's a wrap. The GDPR Weekly Show is an Insurity production. Follow us on Facebook at www.facebook.com slash insurity. Until next time, bye-bye.